Um, good morning or good afternoon. Uh, I'm Carol Graham. I'm a senior fellow here at Brookings. And uh, I'm also, I've been an academic advisor to the Prosperity Index for many years. So it's a real pleasure to host their US launch of their World Prosperity Index. Um, I've watched this index grow in depth and breadth, and its coverage is really amazing. Um, so accepting that I'm biased because I've been involved in it um, uh, and it's, uh, in some ways, I can say with confidence that this is really a really complete index that complements traditional income data with really good data on reported well-being and, and across a range of domains. Um, and it, it makes a real contribution. I've been involved in well-being research since the early days when we were considered crazy nuts working on happiness. And there's now a whole new science of well-being measurement. And there are efforts by, serious efforts by, for example, the government of, of Britain to include well-being metrics into national statistics. The OECD has already made recommendations for governments around the world um, who want to include well-being metrics to complement income-based metrics in their statistics, how to do that. Even the US um, has, I just finished serving on a National Academies panel where we were tasked with recommending what well-being metrics we would put into our statistics. So there's a lot going on in this area. And efforts like the Prosperity Index, which demonstrate how you can apply these different kinds of metrics to, to complement income-based data, are really important in terms of the progress we've made in, in incorporating more complete measures of human well-being into our thinking, into our an analysis, and into our benchmarks of progress. Um, what sets the Legatum Index apart from lo lots of other efforts in this area is its emphasis on prosperity and defining prosperity quite broadly beyond just material welfare, but also across a range of dimensions of human well-being. And what the index shows is that despite some backsliding, um, which is driven by very difficult situations in particular countries, but despite that, in general, things are on a positive track in the world. In short, life is getting better for many, many people in the world. And I think that's an important story that needs to be told more. Um, the index is also just an incredible resource for scholars and policymakers across a range of disciplines. Um, it's publicly available. The rankings that you see can be disaggregated. You can go down into the rankings on the website and use them. Um, use the different information as you like. Um, and you can get answers to questions across a range of domains from governance, freedom, health, education, and income to opportunity and prosperity and mobility, which is the topic of today's discussion. Um, I hope that in, in addition to enjoying participating in today's discussion on prosperity and mobility, um, that you'll also take some time after to explore all the other rich dimensions of the index. Um, so before introducing the man behind all these numbers, uh, I would like to thank Christina Golubsky for organizing this whole event on part of Brookings and also Neil O'Reilly, and then Chloe Sandham from the Legatum End. It was a joint effort to get this um, event launched across, across the Atlantic, but it seems to have worked so far. Um, so now over to Nathan Gamester, who's the team leader for the Prosperity Index. He manages to pull this effort off every year in a seemingly effortless manner, but I know it's not effortless. A lot of work goes into this. So over to Nathan to talk about the index, and then we'll have a panel discussion. Well, Carol, thank you very much. Um, it's great to be here. And um, let me just add my word of thanks to Brookings and also to Carol specifically um, for and not only all the help that um, you've given to the Prosperity Index, but also in pulling this event together today. So thank you very much for that. I think I'll start by um, being very British and commenting on the weather, because it's, uh, it's not often that a Brit travels abroad and longs for the weather back home. Uh, but having woken up this morning and uh, felt how cold it was, that's the position I found myself in. So um, it's a very strange position to be in, but anyway. Um, the Legatum Institute is a London-based charitable think tank. Our mission is to help people lead more prosperous lives, and all of the programs that we do achieve, work towards achieving that. We have, an, we have a transitions program which is run by Anne Applebaum, which looks at the process the nations go through when moving from autocracy or authoritarianism towards democracy. We have an economics program which looks at issues such as free markets, the size of government, and the relationship between the citizen and the state. We have a cultural program which looks at 
the role played by different aspects of culture and society in shaping prosperity. And finally, we have the Prosperity Index, which is our signature publication. We launch it every year. We've been doing it for eight years now, and we'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail. I mentioned we're a charity. We're registered as a charity both in the UK and also in the US as a 501c3. Did I get that right? Um, uh, here in the States. Now, I'm going to go through some of the data and the findings from the Prosperity Index, but before doing that, I want to ask a question. How are you doing? It's a question that we ask each other and we answer several times a day, two, three, four, five times a day. And if you're anything like me, you probably have a pretty standard way of responding. Fine, thanks. Yep, I'm good. It's kind of automatic. It's kind of autopilot. Perhaps even um, the sort of the classic British understatement, can't complain. I don't know if that's one that you use here in the States. But what if you actually had to think about the answer to that question? What if you had to step back, think about your life, how you are today, and give more than a three-word answer? What would you include? What would be the aspects that go into your longer answer about how you are doing? How about this? I'm doing well, thanks. I've got loads of money in my bank account. Maybe. Maybe economic security, income plays a part, but surely it's not everything. How about this? I've got air in my lungs. I'm healthy. I'm fit. I'm doing well, thank you. Again, that's probably part of it, but it's not the whole thing. How about this? I've got a decent education. I earn fairly well. I can provide for my family. I'm doing well, thank you. Again, that's probably something towards kind of our overall state of well-being, but again, it's not all of it. How about this? You know, I've got great friends, a strong family. I feel loved. I feel cared for. I'm doing very well, thank you. Well, the truth is that if we were to really step back and try and answer that question fully with a full assessment of how we're doing, we wouldn't use just one single measure, either explicitly or implicitly. We would use a number of different aspects of life to go into answering that question. Now, let's ask the same about national success. How's the US doing? We could be tempted to look at, say, the size of the economy and simply say the US is the most successful country in the world. And by GDP alone, that may well be true. But just as we don't define our own success using a single measure, surely we shouldn't do the same for nations either. And this isn't a new concept. In March of 1968, the then Senator Bobby Kennedy gave a speech in which he highlighted the flaws of using, using purely economic measures to define our progress. He said this, our gross national product counts air pollution and cigarette advertising and ambulances to clear our highways of carnage. It counts the locks for our doors and the jails for the people who break them. Yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages. It measures neither our wit nor our courage, neither our wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short except that which makes life worthwhile. That's a wonderful quote from a wonderful speech from a wonderful politician. And while it's superb oratory and a point very well made, it does beg the question, well, what is success? What is prosperity? And the Global Prosperity Index seeks to answer this question. We define prosperity, as Carol mentioned, very broadly. It's our belief that prosperity is multidimensional. We include economic data, of course. We don't want to get rid of that but it's also just one among many other factors that matter for prosperity. The categories we include in the prosperity index are the economy, entrepreneurship and opportunity, governance, education, health, safety and security, personal freedom, and social capital. Across these eight categories, we include 89 individual indicators. The Prosperity Index covers 142 countries, accounting for 96% of the world's population and 99% of global GDP. Now, one of the elements that sets the Prosperity Index apart from other measures, other tools, is the use of both objective and subjective data. We measure each of these eight categories using both hard data and survey data. And the reason we do that is because we believe that putting those two types of data together paints a broader picture. You get a clearer idea of the thing that you're measuring. And so, for example, in our entrepreneurship and opportunity category, we do measure things like business startup costs. Of course, the amount it costs to start a business has a big impact on whether or not somebody who wants to be entrepreneurial can start a business. 
But at the same time, we also measure citizens' perceptions about whether the country they live in is a good place to be an entrepreneur, whether, the, whether society rewards hard work, whether or not people can get ahead if they want to. And so having looked at how the index is put together, I know what you're all thinking. Who's top? Who's bottom? What do the rankings actually say? Now, if we look at the top, you see, you, can you see that? Let's zoom in a little bit more. Uh, Norway ranks first in the prosperity index, as it has done for the last six years. It's getting a bit boring, actually. Norway tends to be the most prosperous country in the world um, and comes top um, of quite a lot of indicators and indexes that measure well-being and happiness and life satisfaction, and it's no different in our case either. Switzerland comes in second, and New Zealand is third. Now, New Zealand is up from fifth last year because of increases both in the economy category, rising 12 places in just two years, but New Zealand's rise is also driven by strong freedom and civil society. It has the highest levels of tolerance in the world. 92% of New Zealanders report being tolerant towards immigrants and 93% towards ethnic minorities. On top of that, New Zealand ranks second in our social capital subcategory, with 96% of New Zealanders saying that they have friends and family they can rely on in times of need. Canada comes in at fifth, the US places 10th overall, the UK 13th, and Germany 14th. And I'll come back to those countries in just a moment. <coughs> Down at the other end of the rankings, apologies if you're at the back and you can't see the bottom of this table. I will explain everything that's on the screen, um, but unfortunately the table is blocking some of your view of, of the screen. Now what's uh, notable at the bottom, we see Central African Republic um, in 142nd last position, followed by Chad and then the Democratic Republic of Congo. And what's interesting about these countries um, across the bottom is that they tend to perform poorly across each of the categories that we measure. Sierra Leone, for example, places last on our health category as it has done for the last three years. In fact, sub-Saharan African countries make up nine of the bottom ten countries in our health category. Seven of the ten countries that spend the least on healthcare in the world are in sub-Saharan Africa, and five of the ten countries with the fewest hospital beds per person are in sub-Saharan Africa. And what's interesting here is that our data predates the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, which indicates that many countries across the region lack basic health infrastructure and are therefore vulnerable to outbreaks such as the one we've seen. But it's not all bad news. When we look back over the past six years, we can see that eight of the ten countries that have improved the most in our health category are also in sub-Saharan Africa. So things are getting better. Now, obviously, the subject of our discussion today is about the role of opportunity in driving prosperity. And uh, we wanted to tackle this subject today because um, the, the idea of the American dream and of America being a nation of opportunity, where work hard, people who work hard can get ahead, where if, regardless of where you're from, your background, your ethnicity, if you put in the effort, then you can get ahead. And I'm looking forward to the discussion with our panelists, so I think we'll go into a little bit more detail about the realities or not of that. Before we get there, I want to dig into a little bit of the data from the US that's coming out of the Prosperity Index um, and compare it to some other countries in the index. Now, the US ranks 10th overall in our index this year, which is an increase of one place, back up into the top 10 this year. Uh, and one of the reasons for its uh, move upwards is to do with an improvement in our economy uh, subcategory, rising from 24th to 17th. And one of the reasons for that is lower unemployment, but also in rising uh, economic sentiment. 38% of people in the US now think that it's a good time to find a job. And that's up from 29% last year. Higher than the UK, which comes in at 18%, but not as high as Canada at 50%. 79% of Americans say that they have the freedom to choose the course of their lives. That's down from 86% in 2011. In fact, the US ranks 49th on that particular indicator, whereas in Canada, 92% of people say they feel free to choose the course of their lives, and in, the, and in Britain, it's 91%. Now, this one may or may not come as a surprise to you, but Americans feel less positively about their government than at any time in the past five years. Approval of government has fallen to 29% from 42% in 2010. Business startup costs in the US stand at 1.5% of gross national income, which is more than double where they stood in 2009. What this means in practice is that it costs just under $1,000 on average to start a business in the US. If you compare that to the UK, where it costs just 66 pounds on average, about $100, and you can see an interesting comparison. 
What about satisfaction with living standards? In the US, 77% of respondents say they're satisfied with their living standards. In the UK, that's 84%, Canada, 87%, and Germany, 90%. What about this one? The question of whether people feel that working hard will get them ahead in life. In the US, that number stands at 86%, which is pretty high in comparison. Uh, and it's a slight decline since 2010, but not significantly so. Slightly higher than the UK, but again, not as high as either Germany or Canada. And the subject that we're going to go into now in the panel discussion is about opportunity and mobility. Uh, and I do just want to draw your attention to uh, a, we, a chapter in this year's Prosperity Index report. I think you all have a copy of this. If you're interested in looking at the uh, issue of mobility and opportunity in more detail, page 19 of this report includes um, uh, a deeper look uh, at that. Um, please don't read it now um, because you'll miss all of the fun stuff, but um, have a look uh, after the panel session. Now with that, um, I will uh, invite the fellow panelists to join me on the stage. Um, and as they do, please, will you join me in welcoming them? So, just by way of introduction, can you all hear me? Is this on? Is this working? Great. Um, let me just uh, say a few brief words about our panelists this afternoon. Charles Murray uh, is the W.H. Brady Scholar at the American Enterprise Institute. Before joining AEI in 1990, Charles was a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute, a political scientist, author, and libertarian. He first came to national attention in 1984 with the publication of Losing Ground, which has been credited as the intellectual foundation for the Welfare Reform Act of 1996. His 1994 best-selling book, The Bell Curve, co-authored with the late Richard J. Hernstein, sparked heated controversy for its analysis of the role of IQ in shaping America's class structure. Charles' most recent book, Coming Apart, describes an unprecedented divergence in American classes over the last half century. Richard Reeves is a fellow in economic studies at Brookings and policy director for the Center on Children and Families. He's also an associate director of Center Forum. Before moving to Washington in the summer of 2012, he worked as a director of strategy for the UK's deputy prime minister. He's a former director of Demos, the London-based political think tank. Richard is the author of John Stuart Mill, Victorian Firebrand, an intellectual biography of the British liberal philosopher and politician. Today, he writes powerfully and persuasively on a wide range of topics, including policies relating to social mobility and the economics and politics of well-being, among other things. <coughs> John Prideau is the political correspondent for The Economist in Washington. Prior to this, he wrote for The Economist, The Financial Times, and The New Statesman as a freelancer, and worked as a researcher in the House of Commons and the European Parliament, but please don't hold that against him. In addition to covering British politics, he has spent time in, in, as an India correspondent in Delhi and financial correspondent in London. In 2007, he was appointed Brazil correspondent in Sao Paulo, where he wrote The Economist special report, Brazil Takes Off. And finally, Carol Graham is the Leo Pazwolski Senior Fellow at the Brookings Institution and College Park Professor at the School of Public Policy at the United University of Maryland. She is also a Research fellow, fellow at the Institute for the Study of Labor. Carol served as Vice President and Director of Governance Studies at Brookings from 2002 to 2004. She has also served as a Special Advisor to the Deputy Managing Director of the IMF and has been consultant at the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, United Nations Development Program, and the Harvard Institute for International Development. She's the author of various books and articles, including most recently, The Pursuit of Happiness Towards an Economy of Well-Being. And with that, I'm going to ask Carol to kick us off and give a short five-minute uh, set of remarks around the idea of opportunity and prosperity. Thank you, Nathan. Um, and it really, it's a real pleasure to comment on this particular aspect of the index because um, it, it's one of the newer aspects of the index and it also reflects my own personal interest in opportunity and its linkages to well-being. Um, and now we can benefit from having data on this uh, compiled in a rigorous manner for over 100 countries around the world thanks to Legatum. So that's a, a good thing. Um, I'm going to focus my remarks on the U.S. And it's a country that's a great example of, well, part because we're here today, but also it's a, it's a country that's a great example of why it's important to measure prosperity across, across a range of dimensions and including the well-being dimension. 
Um, as you can see from the index, the U.S. ranks quite high on the economic score, not least as it remains one of the most dominant economies in the world, and our recovery from the financial crisis was probably the strongest of the OECD economies. So that, that's, I think, what pushed up our ranking um, this past year. But if you look more closely at the data from the sub-indices, um, we're falling behind in many dimensions, and in particular, equally shared access to opportunity and mobility. Um, so I want to add to that story that's already in the index with um, some anecdotal results from my ongoing research on the topic. But before doing that, um, just one comment about the index rankings and methodology, um, and I've certainly shared these comments with the Legatum team, but <coughs> Everybody wants one ranking. That's why everything is sort of merged into one ranking. Who's on top? Who's on the bottom? Everybody always wants to know that. And so that's sort of what the index industry does is you create rankings. But in the case of this very rich index, you have rankings that can often go in different directions. And in particular, when you have um, in some countries, say the Scandinavian countries, the Norways of the world, all good things go together and you get positive attitudes and positive objective rankings and it all makes sense. But if you look more closely, and this is why I encourage you to, to go down into the sub-indices and into the details of the, of, the, of the prosperity index, you'll also see that there's sometimes sort of their puzzles where people in very poor countries, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, can report to be very optimistic or to have very high beliefs that hard work will get you ahead or whatever it is that surprises you because it, has, it doesn't seem to reflect objective conditions at all. Um, so sometimes when you mix and match the objective and the subjective data, some countries can have surprising rankings. So as such, I, I personally encourage you to look at the, at the sub-index rankings and also to look and see where there are puzzles, where there are differences between attitudes in countries and actually objective conditions. And that's particularly a problem for very poor countries where people have adapted to bad conditions, but they retain sort of innate human optimism. And that's, that's a good thing, but it does make this a complicated art. Now back to the U.S., um, it's, a, it's another example of why you need to look at all the different components of, of the sub-indices. Um, our, our most recent analysis of well-being me metrics for the U.S. tell a very different story from the economics sub-index ranking, but our metrics also reflect some of the good points that are made in the opportunity sub-index of the prosperity index. So in the case of the U.S., due to its um, to high levels of top-driven inequality, basically inequality driven by differences between the top percent of the distribution and the rest, and to stagnation in mobility rates, um, I would argue that we're increasingly two Americas, um, and the data bear this out. On the one hand, there's a wealthy cohort, which has access to some of the best universities and hospitals in the world, to cutting-edge knowledge, and to worldwide outlook and information. And most importantly, it's a cohort that has the ability to plan for the future, to seek fulfillment in life, and to pass those abilities on to the, the next generation, right? That one of the things that stands out when you look at the wealthy cohort in the United States is how much they invest in their children, in education starting with preschool, in sports, in music, in, in, in everything. Um, but then a, a less positive story is when you look at the poorest co cohort in the United States. It's for the most part living in the moment, focused on day-to-day -day survival, in poor health and without access to quality education from the preschool level to the university level. And indeed, I just saw another data point which was surprising. Over half of households in the bottom quintile of the income distribution in the United States don't have access to the internet. That's pretty remarkable in today's world, right? Um, again, so you just get completely different outlooks if you, if you look at the rich and the poor in the United States. So one of the things that we've been doing in our research is trying to understand the difference in ability to plan for and invest in the future and therefore have future mobility between these cohorts. And we find that people who face a lot of day-to-day -day struggles, as measured by reported stress, among other things, um, they have very high discount rates. So in non-economist terms, this means that they have difficulty planning beyond today and therefore setting aside resources to invest in the future and the health, savings, and education domains, among others. If you can't get through today without a lot of stress and a lot of struggle, it is very difficult to invest in the future, plan for the future, even think about what the future looks like. Um, 
And there are a number of markers that suggest that a surprising number of people in this country live that way day to day. So we looked at reported stress levels in the U.S., comparing the rich and the poor, and then we compared them to Latin America, which is a region that's long been known for high levels of income inequality and low mobility, even though the region is changing. Um, what we find, and you have some handouts, I don't know if they're on your chairs or under your chairs, that if you look at stress levels in the United States, which is the first handout, versus Latin America, you find that U.S. respondents in general experience more stress than respondents in Latin America. This is based on a simple question in the Gallup World Poll that asks people, did you experience stress yesterday, yes or no? And the answers are robust to lots of other metrics um, of, of measured stress. Well, what's more remarkable than there being more stress in the U.S. than in Latin America, I'm from Latin America, and it's a, it's a part of the world that has great quality of life, so that may reflect the lower stress levels, but is that the difference between the stress levels of the rich and poor in the U.S. are significantly higher than the difference between the rich and the poor in Latin America, a region which has long been known for high levels of inequality. So the poor in this country experience much more daily stress, and again, reflects their that they have less ability to plan and invest in their future. And then, if you want an even starker story, and based in the American dream, basically, belief in hard work, some data that Nathan put up, and the U.S. scored relatively high uh, compared to the rest of the world in terms of the percent of people that believe hard work can get you ahead. But if you compare the U.S. and Latin America, and this is really striking um, slide, in Latin America, you get very little difference in the beliefs of the poor and the rich. Basically, the rel relatively high, a significant percent of people believe that hard work can get you ahead, but there isn't a big difference between the poor and the rich. If you look at the United States, what's remarkable is that even though our average is pretty high, our difference between the poor and the rich is tremendous. So the poor in the United States are much less likely to believe that hard work can get you ahead than are the poor in Latin America. The rich in the United States are much more likely to believe that hard work will get you ahead than the average in Latin America. But the gap between the rich and the poor in this country, I think, is striking. So given what we know, that future attitudes about future, attitudes about future mobility link to people's making investments in those futures, um, it's not a great story about the American dream. Um, so not only are opportunities unequally shared today, but they're likely to become more so, precisely because one cohort isn't thinking about the future, does not have the means and the resources to invest in it, and, and also lacks confidence in that future versus another cohort that's got all the means in the world. So unlike much of what is in the Prosperity Index that is a positive story about things getting better, I think this is a story that is um, really gives cause for worry. I, I think other panelists may will speak to this, obviously. Um, but it's also the, the kind of differential insight that you get from looking at different kinds of data is the kind of contribution that the index makes across a range of domains by, by disentangling um, the numbers and going beyond just income data. Carol, thanks. I'm going to ask Charles Murray to uh, go next with his sort of opening uh, gambit on um, opportunity and prosperity. There is going to be an opportunity for the panelists to pick up on what each other say uh, afterwards, but um, first of all, Charles, if you mind sort of going for another five Thank minutes. you, Nathan. <clears throat> I'm, I'm always of the opinion that panelists of this sort uh, should, uh, panels of this sort should, should not all repeat each other. And so I am going to focus actually, uncharacteristically for me, on on somewhat more positive ways of looking at opportunity in the United States. But I want to emphasize that I'm doing that because I assume everybody else is going to talk about problems. And after all, I did write a book called Coming Apart, which does not sound optimistic about uh, of these issues. I agree. I, I could have said about almost everything that Carol said, yeah, and I've got some more stuff that reinforces what you said. So we have huge problems with regard to mobility with regard to income stagnation at the bottom end and so forth. And yet we also live in a, a country where we are almost afraid to trumpet the ways in which it's still a land of opportunity. Uh, let me just give you the example of uh, somebody working at a $10 an hour job. 
Now, getting a $10 an hour job around Washington, D.C. area at this moment in history, as opposed to about four years ago, isn't that hard. In fact, it's pretty easy. If you're willing to do manual labor, it's real easy. All right. Well, $10 an hour, 40 hours a week, that's only $400. It's hard to live comfortably on $400 a week. But suppose you and somebody else get together. The, the obvious way to do that is with a, a, a spouse. But it could also be you know, two guys saying, well, let's, uh, let's pool our resources and get an apartment together. And we'll both work for 40 hours a week at $10 an hour. Well, now you're talking about $800 a week. You've got payroll taxes coming out of that, but you don't have any income taxes to speak of. Uh, 58 weeks a year, you're talking about $40,000. You can live. Comfortable. Life. There, are, there are graduate students all over the United States living comfortable lives in less than forty thousand dollars a year. That's that is actually historically remarkable. That working at very low level jobs for not that long a week historically, and you can have a standard of living that's just fine actually. And if you stick with it, and this is also another characteristic, you don't stay at $10 an hour. The stagnation of wages is real, but you don't stay at $10 an hour because there's another thing about opportunity in the United States that it's almost as if we're embarrassed to talk about, which is if any employer will tell you this, is there anybody in the room who is actually an employer of people? One, two, we got it with about three hands, okay. And you can contradict me if I'm wrong. Good help is hard to find. I don't mean highly educated uh, Princeton graduates. Uh, I'm talking about people who will come to work every day on time, be cheerful, and work hard. It's really hard to find people like that. And furthermore, if you are that kind of person, the odds in the ordinary American business that you will get noticed are very high. And that's why when McDonald's has employees who are flipping burgers, who come to work every day, cheerful, on time, work hard, uh, are good at what they do, they tend to get promoted. A story in my own personal experience is not uncommon. This involves somebody who was hired at the mid-20s. Uh, it was a woman, young woman, uh, hired to be a barista. Is there anything other than flipping burgers that is more stereotypical about the dead-end job? And this was at a large uh, high-end thing in New York called Italy, which has all sorts of different <laughs> shops and within it selling things from Italy. Well, she, she made her, her espressos for about six or eight months and had the presentation of self that I described and she was then promoted from her 10 bucks an hour to a little bit higher salary and managing seven of the, uh, of, the, of the stalls, as it were, in that part of the store. And in another year, she was managing 30 people. And she was told in no uncertain terms that her future with that corporation, because they have branches around the United States, was very bright. This is not somebody who'd taken a bunch of courses in marketing or in retail or in anything else. Uh, she did not have any really cool new ideas for how to uh, sell stuff there or to manage the payroll or anything else. She, she just showed up and worked hard and was cheerful and was competent. And she got ahead in the classic way. Uh, that is not uncommon among people who bring these very basic qualities to the workplace in the United States. That's called a chance to get ahead. And if we doubt that that's the case, Let's take a look at the natural experiment that the United States has going for it right now where we have millions of poorly educated people coming across the border, sometimes illegally, who are getting ahead. In the case of the Asians, we have a, a population of new Americans who are getting ahead spectacularly well. They aren't all coming over here from, uh, from upper income families in China or Southeast Asia and adding to it. They are coming here often with nothing, including no language, and we all know what happens if those of you who have teenage children in the Washington area and you go to the graduation ceremonies, you all know who the first 10 people are in the graduating class, where they come from. They come from Asia. This country, despite all its problems, is a place where getting ahead isn't that hard. And that statement is pretty revolutionary in discussions of where the United States is. Now, 
Uh, over the course of the rest of the panel, I will reestablish my credentials as a thoroughgoing pessimist, all right? But what I have just said is not uh, wishful thinking. It is not talking about isolated cases that uh, you have to cherry pick. We're talking about a deeper problem, which is that 50 years ago in the United States, it wasn't so hard to find employees who came to work every day on time, worked hard, and were cheerful. Now it is. And that speaks to cultural changes that have occurred. Um, in the book Coming Apart, I discussed those cultural changes at some length. And in the response to the book, there were a variety of people who said, no, I didn't understand. This was just a problem of lack of jobs. Uh, and once the, if we had a decent job market, decent wages, all of these problems would disappear. I submit to you the only people who make that argument are people who don't deal face-to-face, uh, -face, day day-to-day with working class America. I, I submit to you the only people who make that argument are people who do not employ uh, others. That, it, that the cultural change that it has occurred out there is profound, it's widespread, and it is fundamentally reshaping the nature not of the American economy, uh, but of the stuff that has made America, America. Charles, thank you very much. Richard Reeves. Thank you, Nathan. As uh, someone who's moved from uh, the UK uh, to the US and spent two years here, I can add a new data point on how people answer the question, how are you doing? I uh, like the way you do that. Um, so the British people will sometimes say, can't complain. My particular favorite from, Br from British people, though, when you ask how they're doing is, mustn't grumble. <laughs> it's peculiarly British. They then go on peculiarly either to grumble at great length um, or, in a way, more perversely, having said, mustn't grumble, then to go on to say that they've been promoted, their kids are doing very well, they've come into some money, etc. In the US, when you ask the same question, how are things doing, Americans say, great, except for the divorce, the loss of the job, the kids doing drugs, or whatever. And so there's a kind of, people get on the different side of it. So you're right, there's a habitual answer, but in America, the kind of habitual answer has to be great. Uh, and then the real truth comes out. Um, uh, I'm going to keep my, my comments pretty brief. I'm just going to respond a little bit to what Charles said as well. But um, the question of how we think about well-being uh, in relation to economic growth is hardly a new one. It's been around pretty much since recorded history. Um, it was worried about by 19th century economists, and it was worried about by John Maynard Keynes. So just to add a British and older voice to the Robert Kennedy quote, John Maynard Keynes wrote the following. In 1930, he wrote an essay called Economic Possibilities for Our Grandchildren. And he said in that that within... A, a century was his estimation, so we're getting quite close. By that point, we'd have had sufficient economic growth and compound interest growth that for the first time since his creation, man will be faced with his real, his permanent problem, how to use his freedom from pressing economic cares, how to occupy the leisure which science and compound interest will have won for him, how, in short, to live wisely, agreeably, and well. And it seems to me that the index is trying to get at that sense of living wisely, agreeably, and well um, in its kind of multidimensional approach. And I, I applaud the efforts for doing so. Where, of course, Keynes and Mill before him and everybody else has always been wrong is assuming that there comes a point in economic development where people will say, enough is enough. We don't need any more economic growth. Uh, we've all got enough stuff. Uh, we can stop worrying about that and move to a post-materialist age. The truth is that that moment never comes because one of the, one of the magical things about economies and markets is that they do create uh, new demands um, as well as new supply. And so whereas 30 years ago air conditioning in the U.S. might have seemed like quite a luxury, now, arguably correctly, it's seen as a necessity and so on and so on and so on. So it will economic growth will never cease to matter. However, it may matter less, relatively speaking, to other things uh, when it comes to well-being. Um, I'll just say something kind of briefly about the opportunity side of the index. And I'm, I'm delighted that it's in there for the reasons that um, Carol and others have mentioned, um, because it seems to me that the answer to the question of kind of freedom to choose your own course through life is fundamentally an opportunity question. It's fundamentally about the extent to which you're not inhibited by the circumstances of your birth, by your race, by your gender, your sexuality, from leading the kind of life you want, Do choosing your own job, choosing your own spouse, now of either gender. So the two guys that Charles mentioned may, in fact, be spouses. Um, rather than just two guys getting together. And it, I think you can tell a good story that the enlargement of individual freedom to lead their own lives their own way um, has been captured by this index really rather well. The problem is that 
whilst the late US labour market is actually rather meritocratic in the way that Charles identifies, it's actually quite true that people who've got skills and grit and work hard and so on, actually it looks as if the labour market doesn't treat them too badly once they're in the labour market. There's a couple of problems. One is once you're out of the labour market for too long, um, it's difficult sometimes to get back in. So there's a scarring effect from long-term unemployment. I see Gary Burtless, my colleague in the audience here. But I think more troublingly, there is nonetheless huge persistence of income across generations, which is where most of my work is. And I don't think Charles would necessarily disagree with this, and his own work supports some of it, which is it is the case that we have sticky ends of the income distribution in the US, intergenerationally speaking. So broadly, if you're born into the bottom 20% of the income distribution, you've got about a 40% chance of staying there as an adult and less than a 10% chance of making it to the top. And then you'll see the same figures essentially repeated at the, at the top of the income distribution. So there is, there is mobility, but intergenerationally, the extent to which children's uh, status on the, on the income ladder is affected by their parents is very, very strong, and it's at least as strong in the US as many other countries. So that kind of intergenerational mobility is a problem, and I think the reason that's happening um, is that most of the damage is done before people enter the labor market. Um, so whereas the labor market might actually be relatively meritocratic, you see huge differences in skill development, access to education, health, family stability, uh, some of which Charles has already mentioned. And so that is a problem. Um, the American dream has already been kind of mentioned, and if you define it in that way, relative mobility, then the American dream's in trouble. And I think as Carol hinted, there's something self-fulfilling about the idea of the dream. There's something actually rather important about believing in it <laughs> uh, and continuing to believe in it even in difficult times because that's what might lead us to invest in ourselves and our own children um, in, in the future and that might in and of itself lead to mobility. Last couple, very brief last couple of points. It's striking to me, and I'd, I'd like to hear more from Nathan on this, that when I looked at the index, the, the uh, correlate within the index that most strongly seemed to be related to social mobility measured by earnings elasticity, which is suboptimal in some ways, but it appeared to be the social capital sub-index uh, of, the, of the prosperity index. And if you look at the social capital sub-index, that does include very Charles Murray-esque type uh, issues like uh, family stability, marriage, volunteering, um, trust, and so on. And you'll find in that index that on one score at least, the US does very well. 80% of Americans have helped a stranger in the last year, which is the highest um, anywhere in the world. And so not to get, be all doom and gloom, there is some kind of good news there in terms of uh, generosity of spirit towards people. One final thought though is that when I, and this is a gut feeling rather than an empirical point, I think the index does a great job overall. I mean, you see the countries at the bottom, you, you, you sense it's getting at something. But there's something about the countries at the top. It's top nine, Norway, Switzerland, New Zealand, Denmark, Canada, Sweden, Australia, Finland. When I looked at that list, it sort of bothered me in a way. And I was trying to get at what it was that bothered me about it. And I, decided, and I couldn't decide whether to be honest about it or not. I'll tell you what it is, they all sound a bit dull. They don't sound like places that I'd want to live. They all sound a little bit boring. Now, you know, I know we're being webcast, and probably I've now become a hate figure in nine countries around the world. <laughs> but there is something about that. So I just wonder, the serious thought that might lie behind that intuition is that maybe there's something about actually countries that are a bit more disruptive, a bit more dynamic, that are going through change, that have lots of immigration and so on, are actually slightly more interesting and dynamic places to live. So I leave it to other people to say whether or not they're dying to live in any of those nine countries. But I wonder if some, at the top of the index, whether actually there's something just a little bit too prosperous, <laughs> if I can say that about some of these countries, which is another way of saying it may be a little bit dull. But my main point is that we clearly need a multidimensional way of thinking about well-being. Um, we clearly need to think multidimensionally about opportunity. We need to think harder about the openness and fluidity of societies. And we do clearly need to broaden the way we think about it beyond GDP whilst not losing it. And so to the extent that this moves us in that direction, I'm hugely for it. We need if you like, to think about prosperity pluralism rather than a unitary way of thinking about it, which is just measured by GDP. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. For the sake of the Q&A session, which is coming afterwards, I do hope there are some people in the audience from one of those nine countries <laughs> that was just mentioned. Um, and with that, I hand over to John Prideaux. Thank you very much. I'm Anglo-Norwegian, so I can take uh, up your challenge uh, <laughs> right away. And, uh, Where do you live? I'm only, only actually a quarter Norwegian, but I'm delighted to see Norway still at the top of the uh, ranking. And I, actually, I can confirm Richard's uh, imp uh, impression that it is, in fact, rather a dull place. Um, very lovely, but, um, but, but dull. A lot of the anxiety that we pick up in America um, at, at the moment about you know, sort of what shape the country is in uh, comes back again and again to the kind of single data point, which is income inequality. 
if you go back a few years, there was a good argument going on among economists about whether it was really real, you know, whether something was being missed, and so on and so forth. Now I think you know, the consensus is, is absolutely there. Income inequality has been growing, um, not just in America, in a lot of different societies. And in a way, it's good that we've got to this point that we have, because then you can begin to have another debate, which is, you know, if you believe it, you know, it's a good thing, let's, let's talk about that. It might be good, it might be bad. If you believe it's a bad thing, are there things that we might be able to do to, uh, to mitigate it? Um, but I would suggest that although this is something that people worry about on, on both right and left, um, it's not necessarily uh, a good idea for um, governments to have as a name uh, to reduce uh, income inequality or indeed to go back to you know, the sort of 1950s golden age in America where incomes were more equal and, and there was more social mobility purely because the kinds of things that doing that would require governments to do would be so heavy-handed that I think they would quite swiftly become sort of incompatible with, with living in a, a society with as high a sort of price, that puts such a high price on freedom as America does. Um, that said, clearly, um, that presents us with a new question, which is what might a good, unequal society look like? Um, and that, in a way, is a strange question to pose, because there are a lot of people who will tell you that um, it's impossible to have a healthy democracy without a healthy middle class, and so on, and that you know, all these trends uh, in income inequality are, 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 are regrettable. Um, and they, might, they may be right. Let's, let's see. And it's certainly true that if you look at the countries on the Legatum uh, ranking that do poorly on income inequality, uh, by which I mean they're very unequal, they're not necessarily societies that we in America would want to copy. You know, places like South Africa um, do very badly, have very unequal income distribution. Brazil, where I used to live, also does as well. But might it be possible to constitute a society that's both highly unequal in terms of um, who gets uh, the gains from uh, GDP growth and, and somehow sort of good at the same time. I think there are things that governments can and kind of should do to, to sort of uh, to mitigate it. But as I said, I'm not sure that uh, actually reversing uh, th these processes which we've seen going on for a long time is either kind of desirable or necessary. But just quickly, some things that governments might do. In America, it's very striking, but though the tax system is relatively progressive, when you look at how the federal government actually spends uh, tax money, it's, it's really not. Um, America manages to spend um, more on those in the top fifth of income distribution in terms of sort of uh, public uh, resources than, than on the bottom fifth. Um, uh, you get you know, the very large tax breaks for things like mortgage interest relief, um, uh, some of the tax breaks on capital gains, um, some of the agricultural subsidies tend to skew very heavily towards those at the top of the income distribution. So one thing that we ought to do, uh, perhaps, uh, is, uh, is change that. And then we may want to think a little bit about um, some sort of unorthodox uh, ways of providing uh, goods to those at the bottom of the income uh, spectrum. And Charles Murray has, has written about minimum incomes um, those are the sorts of uh, sort of creative ideas that people are not really sort of pushing at the moment that, that we perhaps ought to be thinking about. But if we accept my premise that um, you know this trend is probably not going away, it's not something governments will be able to reverse, even if they can play with it on the margin and, and probably should. What might a good unequal society look like? I think it might be somewhere where a lot of the things that we think of as private, uh, sorry, as public goods now, which are, uh, tend to be provided through general taxation. Um, would be provided privately. So I, I could imagine, you know, taking my son to my, you know, local park in Washington and finding that the maintenance of the park was generally generously supported by by the by coke industries or, uh, or, or you know, something that's already happened. You know, the, uh, a lot of uh, income inequality ought to bring a golden age for for nonprofit institutions. Perhaps those institutions could get more involved with providing sorts of public goods that we tend to provide through general taxation at the moment. Um, I read an article the other day which said that in 2010, 10.7 uh, million people were employed by NGOs in America, which is a larger number than were employed in finance and in construction combined. Um, so when, when good people like Richard and, and Bill Goulston 
right things at Brookings and looking at how income inequality might might be uh, you know sort of might be changed in America. This is truly you know a, an act, a selfless act because um, institutions like Brookings ought to ought to do extremely well out of uh, income inequality. But but there's one thing that I think we perhaps ought to uh, think about just quickly, uh, which uh, Richard has already touched on, which is which is meritocracy. Um, if we were to move to this sort of society in which um, more public goods were provided privately um, in a sort of philanthropic way, I think one thing we'd need to also do is uh, re-examine the whole idea of, um, of meritocracy. Um, if you take a sort of couple of hundred year view, um, we've been rather smug, I'd suggest, um, in Western democracies over the past couple of generations because we thought we'd sort of invented a new sort of society, um, a, a meritocratic society where, um, where sort of what you did, your natural <coughs> talents counted for far more than, than what you inherited, you know, property, land, income, and what have you. Um, actually, the studies are piling up, as Richard said, showing that the educational achievements of children are highly, highly correlated with, with those of their parents. Um, and so it turns out that, in fact, what we seem to be doing is, is creating a society. We thought that you know, meritocracy was the sort of antidote to a society in which your position was inherited. And actually, it looks like it's much more complementary than we thought. And I think what follows from that is that um, you know, some sort of revival is required of a uh, rather sort of 18th century idea of the obligation of those at the top of the income spectrum towards those at the bottom. Um, and maybe that's something we, could, we can talk about a bit more. Great, well John, thank you. Um, I do wanna pick up on your question, which is what would a good unequal country look like? Um, and I want, I'd like to ask all of the panelists to answer, but while you were speaking, I noticed um, Richard furiously scribbling, and so I wonder if I could go to him first um, and ask uh, him what does a good, unequal country look like? And I'll add to that, how do we get there? So um, here's, what I, here's where I thought John was going with this, and then he went completely the other way. Um, so, uh, I mean, I agree with you about the meritocracy point and the, uh, and the degree to which the inheritance of status is something that I would argue that the US was actually almost founded against. I mean, the very idea of inherited status, inherited jobs, inherited power was something that was kind of at the founding. And so when you do see these very strong inheritances of income, wealth, education, capital, and clustering more strongly together, then you worry that the market, which was once a very powerfully meritocratic tool, the market battered through cartels and uh, protectionist uh, rackets and so on. The market was hugely liberating and hugely meritocratic. The market now can actually cease to be meritocratic. Where I thought John was going to go is the other way, and I think I'd, I'd argue precisely the opposite um, to what John just argued, which is that a good unequal society is one in which the inequality in one domain is not allowed to bleed over automatically into inequality in other domains. And one way to do that is actually, rather than push more public goods into the private sector, is actually take more goods which are currently private and push them into the public sector, where actually you don't have to pay for them. And so actually, what you want are more, more goods that are, in a sense, not for sale. Uh, and then the background income inequality or wealth inequality doesn't matter so much. If actually you're not buying your health care, then I'm much more relaxed about the fact that you're very much richer than me. If you're not buying your education, I'm very much more relaxed. If you're not buying your public park, and so I actually think you can argue, you can argue exactly the opposite point, <laughs> which is that the more, the more goods are in the private domain, the more it matters that there is huge in economic inequality. And so if we're going to live with higher levels of economic inequality, and that bit I don't really disagree with, I think it's largely difficult to do much about, then we should maybe go the other way and insulate ourselves against these effects by pushing more things into the public sector rather than the private. Just to be boring, I actually do, I kind of agree with you. I, I perhaps wasn't clear enough about what I was saying. I think we w want to move to a world, or perhaps we would ideally move to a world in which more public goods are still public but are provided differently. So my local park's maintenance is funded by a philanthropic organisation. That doesn't make a huge difference to me using it because I can still take my son along and play on the swings. Um, but the mechanism for providing it is, is different. It's that sort of thing that I'm, I, I'm suggesting that we might end up moving towards. Um, Charles Murray, what does a good unequal country look like and how do we get there? I thought that was such a great question. 
Um, <clears throat> and, and I want to make just very briefly a statement that the idea that all of this private wealth could end up being very useful for the public square is something we ought to realize. That, that um, you know what, I, th I think probably Bill Gates' foundation is spending its money more efficiently than governments do to tackle big problems. Uh, there, there are a variety of ways in which private wealth is enabling uh, lots of money to be dumped onto problems that the government doesn't seem to be able to, to do that for very well. However, since we've raised the uh, specter of meritocracy, I guess that, that you can't carry on this discussion without coming to grips with uh, our fundamental misapprehension about meritocracy because it used to be, ah, we have re we have, we are released from the undeserved uh, status because of who our parents were in terms of the land they had, the titles they had, held. What we did not think of when we started this, well, actually, Mr. Young, who wrote Rise of the Meritocracy, did think of it, <clears throat> but which is that, you know what? None of us deserves our IQ. None of us has, done, has, has gotten our IQ through hard work. For that matter, if you want to be really uh, determinist about it, uh, the amount to which we uh, can take credit for our perseverance and in our industriousness is not as great as we used to think it was. Here's the problem. You have a genetic component to almost all of these qualities. Don't worry about whether it's 50%, 40%, 70%. That's not the big point. The big point there is there is a component. Just uh, the last month or two, there was a major new study that came out of uh, King's College where they have the world's leading center on the study of the interaction of genes and the environment, where they did a genome-wide uh, complex trait analysis. It doesn't allow you to identify what genes do what, but for statistical reasons that are really complicated and I don't fully understand, it can make fairly confident statements uh, about uh, complex traits and what are contributing to them. And the, the conclusion in this case was that the, when we know exactly what genes it are, they are that contribute to IQ and to socioeconomic status, they're very likely to be a highly overlapping set. And more specifically, at age seven, of the well-known correlation between socioeconomic status and IQ, 94% of it was mediated by genes by the estimated uh, estimation of this study, which is it's pretty much state-of-the-art kind of work they're doing. Here's the point. The more we equalize the environmental opportunities for people, the, the better we do pre-K, the better we do public education, the better we do the other kinds of things that people like to think affect these, that <laughs> the less environment will contribute to differences in outcomes. And the more it will be concentrated in genes. And I will simply say to you that the evidence is getting stronger and stronger that the large correlation that now exists between parental social uh, socioeconomic status and child socioeconomic status is not because of all the advantages the parents are supplying to their children with their money. It's the gene genes that they gave them. And that is a truth that is resisted now. That we're in front of an onrushing train with regard to these data. In another decade, it'll be unraveled. We have to come to grips with how we have valued places for everyone in a world where those truths apply. Um, just a couple points. Uh, on the genes versus the environment thing, there's also a component of well-being that's genetic genetically determined. I mean, some people are naturally optimistic and others aren't, and we're, we've been working with the distribution of well-being across people. But I do think, I don't think you can get around the very, very different environments. When you talk about things like public education and public kindergartens, they are just very different in poor places and rich places for all kinds of reasons. Um, and so I think you, you get sort of a, regardless of their genetic endowments, some cohorts in this country are disadvantaged from day one. And as Richard mentioned, disadvantaged before even getting into the labor market. But um, just a, another a question for Charles and then a comment on good and bad inequality. Um, I agree with you that if people work hard and have, you know, 
are willing to sort of forego current income for a while and share an apartment, whatever it is, and th they work their way, up the, their way up the labor market, they are very likely to get ahead. But it seems as though the people that are able and willing to do that have faith in their own futures, the willingness to sort of, an ability to postpone current income or all kinds of other things and invest in those futures. And when you have huge differences in beliefs about the future across cohorts, then it isn't a surprise then that you have very different outcomes. And so what I would like to ask you is you, ex you, you talked about a, bit, a, a huge cultural change that was influencing attitudes of, I guess, of some people in the labor market versus others. And I, I, I'm hoping you can explain what, what you think that is a little bit more in detail. And then on good and bad inequality it relates to all this. I mean, I, I agree with Richard. I think a, a good inequality is the kind of society we thought we had that's a meritocracy. There's, there are people, some have some advantages, innate, as Charles mentioned, and non-innate, maybe, you know, just where you were born. Um, you know, there are big regional disparities in this country. But still, not every, not one, one cohort didn't have all the advantages. Um, versus a bad inequality is the kind of society that I think we increasingly have, which is a, you know, persistent advantage for some cohorts and persistent disadvantage for others. But, so as not to end on too um, negative a note, as I was thinking of, or listening to everybody talk about the how are you doing, um, and the U.S. typical great whatever, um, I, I, I'll never forget a comment by a British, British friend of mine who'd moved here who got so sick of being told to have a nice day in U.S. stores <laughs> that she started saying, thank you, I have other plans. <laughs> <laughs> In, in just a moment, we'll open it up to Q&A, so please have questions ready. Um, but Charles, there was a point in there that um, I think Carol was asking you to respond to. Do you mind doing that? The, the quality that Carol is referring to has a label of locus of control uh, for which we've had measures for a long time. And uh, to what extent do you believe that what you do will, will make a difference in your life? And this goes back to, was it John, uh, Richard who pointed out self-fulfilling prophecy? If you have a, a high degree of belief that what you do makes a difference, lo and behold, it works out that way. Locus of control measures, which are administered uh, to samples mostly of college kids, go back to uh, the 1960s. And we have seen a phenomenal drop in the degree to which people feel th they are in control of their own lives. And, and that's with largely college samples, so you can't attribute that to uh, uh, something specific to the lower class or the working class. Why that has happened, uh, Carol, damned if I know. I mean, there are a bunch of things have obviously contributed to it. If, if you're talking about um, uh, the disadvantaged, uh, there is at least one thing that, that has indisputably happened. Uh, since the 1960s, and that is the rhetoric changed. Jesse Jackson, uh, who is not my favorite policy analyst, uh, but he did used to have an exhort uh, exhortations of, of student groups that he talked to, saying it's not your fault if you get knocked down, but it's your fault if you don't get up. And it was a very positive message of uh, you are in charge of your life. But the rhetoric since the 1960s uh, in all sorts of dimensions, um, whether it's in the implementation of social policy or if it's in the messages that are stated, if it's in political rhetoric, are it's not your fault. That you are the victim of uh, circumstances, of, of uh, an economy that has gone global, you're the victim of, you name it. And, you, you, and here's, the, here's, the, here's the problem. A lot of those statements are true, and the worst possible thing you can say is tell a 15-year-old a that. That's, I think that's one thing that, that's involved, Carol. And, and believe me, I'm not pretending to offer anything like an explanation. It, it, one other thing that, that clearly has happened is that with the decline of marriage in the working class, which has been precipitous, whereas it's remained quite strong in the upper middle class, you have children growing up uh, who no longer have, and I'm thinking especially of little boys, Little boys are job ready when they get to be 18, where they will show up every morning and they will be cheerful and they will work hard because that's what they saw their dad do every day, even when he wasn't feeling good and he went ahead and did it. 
And so you have a whole lot of little boys who have never watched an adult male. And you know what? We don't know how to compensate for that when they're 16, 17, 18 years old. It seems to be one of those things you learn uh, in one way and one way only. That's very partial ex answer to your question. On that note, we're going to um, turn over for Q&A. Um, please do keep your question short, raise your hand, wait for a microphone to arrive, and then please um, say who your question is directed at. Thank you. We've got some down the front here. And this coming. Uh, I guess this, this question goes more toward Charles, but the panel can respond. Um, I think that the whole reason we're discussing this today and why this is happening, this growth of income inequality in America, is primarily due to our tax code. I think our tax code is, is killing the, the middle class. And it first comes down to how do we define the middle class? That's the other thing that really frustrates me. I think the definition of middle class is anyone who's not living off a nest egg. So these are people that have to go to work every day, whether they make $500,000 a year or they make $50,000 a year, I think they're middle class because they have to pay the bills every day, they have to hire people, they have to run small businesses, or they have to work within small businesses. And um, so our tax code at this point, I think, penalizes people that have to earn an income and pay home mortgages, car payments, because they're taxed on all income, even though they're paying home mortgages. I mean, you know, they have a home mortgage deduction or they have an apartment. But I mean, let's say education or the cost of starting a business. I mean, let, let's, I have an, ortho, an orthodontist friend, $400,000 in debt. He's 32 years old. So here he is, he goes out, he makes $200,000. He's taxed on every dollar he pays back for that $400,000 in debt. So that, I mean, if you had $2 million in the bank and you make $150,000, you're taxed the same as if you're a million dollars in debt and you make $150,000. And that's where our system breaks down. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll hold that and have one more question as well. Just two rows back. Two rows back. Thank you. Hi. Um, Larry Checo, Checo Communications. Uh, just a couple of things. Um, Mr. Murray talked about uh, 60 years ago, the rhetoric was different, but the economic climate in this country was amazingly different as well. There were a lot of middle class jobs where people can earn enough money that they could provide for their families. Um, I don't know when the last time you tried to live in Washington, D.C. on $40,000, but it's pretty difficult. Um, to John, um, I really don't like this idea of the private sector taking over public uh, domain because, quite frankly, what you're really depending on is the kindness of strangers. Uh, if uh, the Coke Industries decides to you know, fund your park, great. What if next year they decide not to? Government is an organizing principle. It's the only way we live together. The only common good can be distributed by the government. I'm sorry, I, we're stuck with it, whether you like it or not. Okay, so the tax code is killing the middle class, first question, and then uh, secondly, just uh, any more comments on whether or not private sector should provide public goods. Anybody particularly keen to take those? Carol? Just on the, on the private public question, I wrote a book, God, ages ago, 15 years ago, called Private Markets for Public Goods, and it was looking at experiments around the world with things like vouchers in education and uh, privatization of social security systems, things that were happening in emerging market countries, not in the US or Europe. And what was very clear from that research was that in countries where the public sector was really failing, just in, 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 incapable of delivering public goods, these private experiments had some positive benefit because it was sort of better than zero, right? I mean, but also with a huge risk factor, a lot of heterogeneity in outcomes, depending a lot on how organized local voices were. So there was a lot of regressivity too. So there was some progress, but but I, I don't think those are trade-offs that most um, people in countries with you know sound enough public institutions to deliver basic public goods would want to make to introduce that much variability, but. You know, I'll leave it to John to comment on that. And um, Charles Murray, is the tax code killing the middle class? I have absolutely no competitive advantage uh, about the tax code. Um, I'm, I'm a taxpayer. I, I will just make one observation. I was I was doing uh, <clears throat> some uh, 
work on the 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 one percent and the top five percent and so forth, and you're in the top five percent if you're making less than a hundred thousand dollars a year, <laughs> and and it's the top five percent that pays what percentage some eighty odd percent of. Uh, of, of income taxes, and you're not talking about rich people paying taxes there. But I don't, I'm not a tax expert. Just a quick answer on tax and orthodontistry, and also then to, to come back to on the other question and when you mention your friend who's four hundred thousand dollars in debt i immediately thought of the costs of training to be an orthodontist and that if i were designing a public policy that's probably where i would push um, i think one of the worrying things in america at the moment is that the inflation and the cost of getting a college degree um, uh, you know even with all the financial aid available and student loans and so forth does tend to push in the opposite direction to, to meritocracy and that's something to worry about in terms of how you design a kind of tax code that's friendlier it's incredibly and Richard actually has some experience designing public policy so I should defer to him on this but it's incredibly hard to make a tax code sensitive to all the sorts of changes in a person's circumstances that you'd want to um, a, that's very hard to do. B, it's really hard to do without building in all sorts of kind of odd incentives for people to behave in a certain way, which might not actually be a desirable outcome. So I think, you know, um, there are definitely, you know, the American tax code is certainly no model. Um, but um, I, I'm not sure that you can sort of use it um, uh, I, I, to get to kind of where you'd like to get to, ideally. Um, just on the... I suppose what I was trying to des describe is a society as it might be, rather than my sort of ideal society. I mean, I, I, you know, I, uh, there's an awful lot to like about 1950s America and a society in which things, public goods, are provided through uh, from a very broad base of taxation, um, you know, by governments uh, and, and so forth. But you know, some of the data that Charles just mentioned in terms of the number of people paying tax in America. You know, if you extrapolate, it's always a bit dangerous to extrapolate from current trends, you know, kind of into the future, but you don't have to go very far to get to a place where the tax base is sort of incredibly narrow. Um, you know, you're, you're taxing really quite a small number of people to provide public goods for everyone. And it, it, in order to do that, you're going to have to tax them so heavily that they may end up coming up with all sorts of avoidance strategies even more so than they do now. And in that situation, you may be better off appealing to um, you know, the kindness of strangers, as, as you put it, um, which is something that only works if you go back to you know, that sort of slightly 18th century idea that it, you know, if you are Bill Gates and you've done spect spectacularly well, you, know, you have an obligation um, to provide uh, you know, some kind of welfare to the people, you know, at the bottom. And perhaps, you know, cross your fingers, perhaps they will turn out to do a better job through the Gates Foundation um, than, than some government bureaucracies. I do think Carol's absolutely right. This would be a society in which the variance between um, uh, the, you know, the standards of, of kind of public provided, public services, by which I mean kind of services free at the point of use, uh, or almost free, would be greater. Um, and that's, you know, that's uh, something to think about. A couple more questions. Uh, gentleman right at the back, and then gentleman here, uh, just on the end of the row here. Hi, Jim Klumpner, a question for Charles Murray. I was confused by your argument about IQ and inequality. Are you saying that the variance of IQ in the United States is greater than the variance of IQ in Sweden, and that's why we have more economic inequality? I was making a couple of points. One of them is that the more you equalize environment, the more that the remaining uh, differences are genetic. I mean, that's just a, an arithmetic tautology. And <clears throat> so in that sense, the better you get at providing equal environments for all children, the more that success is going to depend on these unearned <laughs> things that are just as unearned as the fact that your father was an earl. That, and that is going to be true not just in the United States, it is going to be true in every country of the world. Now you can uh, institute public policies in Sweden 
which produce a level of income inequality which is X percent uh, smaller than it is in the United States. Yes, you can use public policy for those ends. I was suggesting to all of you that we have we're going to have to quit living in the never-never land in which American in intellectuals seem to want to live, in which, um, oh, if we only provide good pre-K education for everyone, uh, then, then we'll see these wonderful increases in the, the bottom. And, and Carol, here's where the data are, it's not one study, it is study after study which says, the environmental causes of differences are not things like how much people talk to their toddlers, how many words children are exposed to before they go to uh, elementary school, how good the schools are. This goes all the way back to the Coleman report, but, it's, but now it's much more sophisticated. The environmental effects are overwhelmingly concentrated in what is, con concentrated in what is called the non-shared environment. This is a, a, a finding which is a consensus across ideological differences among the social scientists who studied it. Non-shared environment means things like peers, uh, things like events in the womb. Uh, it, it, it could mean uh, differences in the environments in which kids grow up because the parents divorce between the first and the second kid. But whatever the elements of the non-shared environment are, none of them lend themselves to systematic, programmatic inter interventions which manipulate the environments. The things we know how to manipulate in the environment are not the things that are the source of environmental variation in things like IQ. Can we take a couple more questions? Uh, gentleman on the end, so just behind you there with the spectacles. Yes, I'm Jed Schilling with the Millennium Institute, and I just wanted first to comment um, that we do work supporting sustainable development and worked in Bhutan to try to measure gross national happiness and couldn't get it into a single variable. So this is very interesting work on doing that. Uh, but we do link economic, environmental, and social factors in doing things. I have uh, three quick questions. One, on the point that was just made about the genetic basis of uh, people's capacity. One thing those studies, and you mentioned, did not take account of, which other studies have shown is very important, is access to adequate nutrition for young people. And if young people aren't adequately nutrition, and even their mothers during pregnancy, their intellectual ability is significantly reduced. So here we have a question of <clears throat> not right to life, but right to equal opportunity and whether there ought to be some significant efforts to make sure that people receive adequate nutrition so that they can benefit from whatever genetic base that they have. So that would be one factor. You'd mentioned in the employment issue the story of a woman who'd done very well from a 10-hour job. I know a case where somebody who's worked very well and lost two jobs because her bosses were worried that they might be losing their job to her. So you also have this factor in the structure of the environment where in many companies they're not promoting maximum efficiency. More senior people are promoting their own local short-term interests. So how do you deal with that? It's not perfect, but it's more, pra it's more normal what happens in many of the economy. And the third question for Nathan is, <clears throat> and all the factors you took into account are very important, but there's another factor, um, which I was going to say environment, but after Charles talked about environment as a situation in which we live, I use ecosystems or biosystems and why that isn't taken into account in looking at the long-term prosperity. Because one, it's a very important long-term factor to be taken into account and I think that Norway or Finland would be doing very well in those areas because they're env very environmentally conscious and protecting the environment so that we will have enough resources for the next generation, whereas the United States and places like China and India are not. And we do face a severe long-term uh, challenge of continuing exponential growth when the resources on which we depend are not growing exponentially and we have to adapt to them because our global footprint is now one and a half planets and that is clearly not sustainable. So I think that's an important factor to take into account in this um, indicator that you have, which is very interesting. Thank you. Real, quick, real quickly, uh, I'm glad you raised that, Jed, because um, 
if you're talking about environmental effects, there is a big effect on a variety of things, including IQ, between no education system and an education system. There is a big effect between, uh, well, okay, there, there are caveats that there are effects of, of uh, poor nutrition uh, on IQ of arguable size. And so if you're talking about the initial deficits of environments, such as no education versus education, yeah, there's an effect. Once, once you get beyond that, in, it's not a linear function. So that the effect, let's go with IQ, the effect of having education is big. Once you have the education, the fact that you go to National Cathedral School versus go to Valley Elementary School um, uh, is not that big. And I use those examples because two of my children went to one and two of my children went to the other. Um, uh, so so it's, it's increments after those initial effects that don't have much. Right, right, right. Um, I know that we haven't um, addressed all of those questions yet, but in the interest of time, I do want to take a couple more and then we'll come back to all of them. So there's a gentleman here in the red tie and the lady two rows behind as well. I, I should pose this uh, question, which is from Norway, in the sense of being boring, I suppose. Uh, just so you can hear the question and then you can hear the context. Uh, are you a little concerned that of 89 indicator variables to determine this prosperity index, so many of them are subjective? And I would like to just mention two. I noticed one was confidence in government. This is a question to people, a polling result, versus, let's say, something objective, like the number of successive years in which the country has, has had uh, successful and genuine democratic elections. One is objective. The other is subjective. Uh, another one is, what is your tolerance of ignorance? Again, a polling question, as opposed to, let's say, an objective measure. An objective measure would, how many immigrants find this country to be an attractive place to go? What are the flows of immigrants to this country? Wouldn't that indicate a, more objectively the desirability of the country? Now, my inclination is to think that people in rich countries have this extraordinarily high attitude about how good their government should be, mostly because they've never seen what governments are like in Mexico, in Egypt, in the Ukraine, uh, in Thailand. They don't know what bad government is, and so when they are giving a, a, a subjective answer to this kind of question, it's relative to what their expectations were five years ago. So maybe the government is less good now in some minuscule aspect, but relative to the entire uh, range of governance around the world, most rich countries don't even know what a bad government is. So I think the question is, how concerned should users of this index be that so many of the indicators are subjective when in fact there is an objective measure that could be offered instead? But I think, by the way, this is an excellent report. I like it. Um, I like the end of your question better than the start of your question. Um, um, we're going to take one more question, then we'll answer those together. Okay. Uh, Mr. Murray mentioned that there are neighborhoods and p communities in the U.S. Where, uh, uh, where children or adolescents don't have examples of working males in front of them, and that is true. Uh, the root of this problem, to some extent, is the deliberately created residential segregation by race, which was created about 100 years ago and persists in many places till today, places like Chicago, and also places where residential segregation is more recent, say even in the last 10 years or 15 years, we have growing residential segregation in some places. So would you like to speak about the role of residential segregation in constricting opportunity? Thank you very much. Um, let me just answer very quickly the question about the prosperity index. Um, out of the 89 indicators that we use, about 30 to 35 are subjective. And so the majority of the indicators are actually objective measures. Um, and, uh, but I completely take your point that there are, um, uh, there are differences in the, data, in the information that you can get from subjective data versus objective data. And, and that's actually one of the reasons why we use both types of data in the index to um, uh, ground or at least complement one another when looking at certain factors. So you mentioned governance, for example, and of course the question, do you have confidence in your government, um, is a, it may get a different answer to actually some of the more objective data on um, 
uh, how effective government is, whether or not the government is stable, whether they're, um, you know, so the, the kind of um, the more uh, traditional objective measures of governance. And um, I completely agree with that point, and that's exactly why we use the different types of data in the index. And it sometimes, and Carol's made this point on several occasions, that um, sometimes those two types of data complement each other, and you have situations where objectively things are good and subjectively people uh, respond in the same way. But actually there are examples where the two diverge, and sometimes the most interesting pieces of, 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 of analysis come to look at the difference between uh, the objective and the subjective data. There was a second part to your question, which was about how people in different countries, can, uh, how you can, well, I think it was, uh, to summarize it was sort of how you can compare one person's answer in one country to another person's answer in another country on, on, on this, using the same question. I wanna hand that over to Carol, because I know that that's something that you've written about a lot. I'm handing me the tough question, right? <laughs> Actually, no, it's a point I made in my opening remarks, too, that, that that's a huge problem. So that in some places, the rankings, say, Finland on, or Norway, the boring places, right? You'll get, you have high expectations, but things work well, so this objective and ob objective data sort of tell you the same thing. And then in other places, particularly places that have adapted to having bad government or bad health, I mean, you often get, you know, the same percent of Kenyans are satisfied with their health as Americans, and yet, you know, the objective conditions are very different, and the example after example of that. Um, and so, one of the things, and it's, we've gone back and forth, because I've always made the case that I would like to see two indices, one of the subjective rankings and one of the objective rankings, and then you really could see where, much more clearly, where these differences are and where these quirks are. The problem is, everybody wants one index, right? So. And I don't think that many people go get down and look at the different objective and subjective data and what they're telling you that's different, which is where the interesting story is. Um, but that's, you know, that's a question going forward. What's the best way to do this? The Uh, of course, I'll respond very briefly because I'm conscious of time. Um, the short answer is there are environmental indicators in the index. We don't have uh, an individual category for the environment. Um, uh, we may do. Uh, we're looking to refresh and update the, the way we conduct the index. Um, so uh, it's sort of a partial answer, but um, when you look lower down, there are indicators of the environment within the index. And watch this space because going forward, we may decide to introduce a, a, an individual category uh, of the environment. Um, but yeah. Um, Charles and then Re Richard. Re real quickly on the, the question about uh, racial segregation as, as a contributing factor to young males not having uh, examples in their neighborhood. Uh, I, I would say socioeconomic segregation, which has been increasing uh, very rapidly over the last uh, couple of decades, is at least equally important with that. And the proof there is you go to white lower class communities and uh, the, the, the residential segregation is such that you can very easily have white uh, lower class communities where they, they have very few role models. Yeah. I, I agree with Gary about the worries about subjectivity. I worried about the, Im the immigration question as well. Um, I think that one of the things that, that can reduce tolerance to immigration is high levels of immigration that then becomes highly politicized. And so one way to apparently be tolerant of it is not, not to have very much of it. And I'm not sure we necessarily want that. Um, I agree with Charles about economic segregation being the new story. Isn't that there isn't a lot of race segregation, but economic segregation is rising. But I also think that underlying the the, the, the sort of working male role model thing, there's there's a danger it, always in conservatism that it, it, it ends up being one or another form of bring backery. It's bring back X, bring back the traditional family, bring back the labour market, bring back whatever. Um, and whether we like it or not, I think the kind of wave of feminism and the changes in the U.S. labour market mean that the kinds of 1950s model, which there was a lot to dislike about, as well as stuff to like about, isn't coming back. And then lastly, I do think that, um, I don't know the study that Charles has referred to on genetics, so I think it's a more contested field still than perhaps he's suggested. Um, and I hope that um, the studies which suggest that genetics don't play such a strong part in the things that matter most for labor market success hold up better than Charles has suggested, because if it turns out that we're not responsible for lots of the things that we end up doing. It reduces the scope for personal responsibility, for personal agency, and that, I think, leads you to a conclusion, which is that we should have massive redistribution. Uh, and then you are into a kind of place where if we're, re if we're really not responsible for the outcomes in our life and we really are just inheriting it, that's an argument for kind of levels of redistribution that are currently witnessed nowhere in the world, let alone the US. 
Well, Richard, thank you. On that note, I think this is a conversation that could go on and on, and maybe it will um, once we've drawn formal proceedings to a close. Um, please do help yourself to food and drink, which is at the back, um, and it just leaves me to say thank you very much to you all for coming, and also thank you to the panellists as well. <laughs> <laughs>